Hello everyone, this is Dr. Boz. We are live on uh, Tuesday night. I am actually looking at buttons I was saying, give me a sound check. Everybody can hear me? We have a really good live tonight. I have an announcement at the end of the evening that I shared with my support group this morning and they definitely, thanks Rhonda Bishop, uh, they definitely uh, were a little shocked. They said, no, really? So I'm nervous, I'm nervous to tell you, um, but uh, I am, I'm gonna stick true to spirit. So uh, thanks for everybody saying where you're from. I love seeing that. I'm gonna check my numbers here. And I am going to tell about a story and a case that I am, I have learned a lot from. I've used this case to help teach a concept that, well, that I think everybody that's keto should know and it's not been easy until this, uh, well, this patient gave me the perfect uh, teaching moment. And from there, I've used that story several times in a way that I think really has helped people. Oh, please tell me that's not gonna die. Oh, might need to get another strip out. Oh, shoot, hold on. Well, it's a glucose of 65. I got that part done, uh, but my ketone strip just failed. So let me give a, another little, another little try of it. Um, I put it in too early <laughs> and then I touched only a little bit of blood to it. So let me try again. Um, I am fasting uh, on the, I don't know, a long time <laughs> since Sunday. And it's, um, even though it's Halloween, I am not uh, going to be passing out candy or using candy tonight. So um, I, I am going to drink some bubble water here and I'm really ready for it actually. Let's see, ketones. 3.4. I feel a little a little jittery, so I was like, I, I bet you they're on the sore. All right, I am gonna uh, drink some pucker up uh, and uh, have some Perrier. For those of you that have closely watched our website, we have had a few issues this past week, so thank you for being patient uh, and knowing that we are we have we're doing our best to fill all the orders that are in there, and uh, we are. We're, we're in between a, another batch being made, so thanks for being patient. I do have a great show tonight. I'm gonna get right to the slides and give you some insight about a patient that, um, well, frankly, um, did scare me uh, because I've seen this before. I know uh, what was about to happen to this guy and, and it's hard. It's hard to watch this again and again. Uh, but maybe, maybe, I hope he's watching tonight because he was part of the 21 day. He is a, a preacher, he is very uh, relatable. And I'm not the first person to tell him, hey, you better get your game on. You've got trouble ahead and I'm gonna show you why. So let's get to the lesson. Uh, we have uh, uh, some questions that I'm going to get to tonight, but I am I am going to tell you this announcement that, that um, that has me nervous. So like, oh gosh, do I want the pushback? <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna be straight with you and tell you the announcement. So stick around to the end. I would love to hear the feedback. I hope some of you come to my rescue and are on, uh, in support or at least encouraging of what I'm about to do. Um, so let's get to the lecture. I am going to use my iPad here to show you some slides because the case is what uh, teaches me. Uh, and I think we'll teach you uh, what what should be talked about more, and that is, is there ever a time when ketones are too high? So this doesn't happen a lot. I have a, a couple of cases where I would love their genetics. <laughs> they make ketones so easy. They shoot them high whenever they just limit food for a few hours. They've been insulin resistant, but uh, the mom makes really high ketones, the daughter makes really high ketones, the dad eats the same thing does not make really high ketones. Uh, so there have been times where ketones are high, but it doesn't scare me. This case does scare me a little more. So let's see if I can hop over to these loom slides. And I'm gonna start talking. I think you guys can still hear me and I can see your comments. So if you can't hear me, um, I'll watch <laughs> to see that you can. So this case is actually from the 21 day, um, and uh, the, the he is 10 days by now into his um, 
his metabolic burst. Not the first time in his life somebody said, you gotta get your game on. I'm gonna move my head there because I'm not sure you can see, oops, that's not my head. Um, this one's my head. You can see, see that 180? Yeah, his blood sugars, uh, that's the range here from 180. And I think the lowest he got down to was like, you know, 110. Um, so just taking a peek at that, his blood sugar is ranging, you know, here's back up to the 180, here is, you know, 140. And that's at a good moment. He had, he had not, I think he was doing a sardine challenge here. So ketones are going high, but that sh blood sugar is not going down. So we're gonna talk about what was going on with this case. His uh, history was he'd been diabetic. He had a, a hemoglobin A1C that was, I think at one point in the 11s, and he said, okay, I, I really need to buckle down. And I agree, <laughs> you really need to buckle down. Um, that it, Okay, sorry, it was not in the 11s. His hemoglobin A1C in November, which is the month of 11, that's where I was getting it from, it was 7.4, so not great. Uh, and then it did get as high as 8.5, so again, not great. <laughs> but having, um, having that, um, that ketone as high as it was um, with a blood sugar this high is scary. Because he is very insulin resistant, his insulin isn't working right, and he's in the transition of becoming keto. He wants to improve his health. He wants to, he's on like six medications for blood pressure and cholesterol. Actually, I don't know about cholesterol. Blood pressure, diabetes. Um, he's not injecting insulin yet, but if he's not careful, he is gonna. So let me um, find this, here we go. All right, so let me uh, just return over here to um, to the story. Okay, we're gonna go to the next slide and I'm going to explain that um, if if these are similar numbers to you with blood ketones where he's like, oh, look at how great my blood ketones are. Like I think one of these, this is a five. His, you know, there's a blood ketone of five, um, but it's in a situation that isn't so comfortable. <laughs> he should be a little more nervous than he is. All right, so I've shown these slides before, uh, and this might look like a ham bone, uh, but it looks like a hot dog if I start out on the other side. So I'm showing you different sections of your muscle layers. I'm getting down to what could be <laughs> a muscle cell, but if I would just start by showing you a muscle cell, everybody on my team said, it looks like a hot dog. <laughs> you gotta explain the context of this a little better. So just, uh, we're diving down one cell at a time, smaller and smaller, until you get all the way down to a muscle cell. Uh, and then in a muscle cell, there are some layers. Uh, that layer starts with, um, I'll move my head over here. That layer starts with the uh, this biphospholipid layer here, these two sets of layers. And inside, you've got a nucleus right here, and then you've got mitochondria here, and mitochondria here, and mitochondria here. So um, now that you have the layout of the land, we have a couple of the players that are insulin and then the insulin receptors. Insulin is the hormone that travels around your body, but the receptor is where it binds on the outside or where it crosses this uh, biphospholipid layer and allows insulin to send a message to the cell. These are the other players. One is called a GLUT4 receptor, receptor, and then it's our little glucose. All right, so in order to explain what was happening in this patient, I'm gonna show you what happens when they have no insulin. In somebody who doesn't have insulin, you see these, um, these insulin receptors right here? Um, they're empty, there's no insulin parking in them. And when that happens, uh, your glucose will stay on the outside. It cannot get into the cell. Uh, this is especially true with muscle cells, but is true with other things like blood-brain barrier or um, not true with red blood cells, but um, any cell that needs fuel, especially glucose, it needs this little receptor. And insulin um, needs to, to allow it in. Here's what typically happens. Here's what would happen in somebody like me. Insulin would bind to those receptors and then these little straws that allow glucose into the cell would say, hey, I have a spot here, come get in. And the cells would uh, fill with some glucose. Those, those mitochondria would start to burn the glucose. As the blood sugar drops, that little GLUT4 uh, or that uh, insulin 
dissociates and says, hey, I, I think this cell has enough, but maybe it could have a little bit more glucose and that other straw, this straw right here, um, the GLUT4 receptor, still stays in its place and can add a, a little bit more glucose in. That's somebody who's very insulin sensitive. Now, it doesn't drain all the glucose from the outside to the inside of the cell, but for effect, I'm just showing that's how the glucose gets in, that's how those cells use the glucose, and that would be normal. That would be an insulin-sensitive patient. The patient that I was showing you about, the one who has high blood sugars and high ketones, uh, there's something going on in the transition he was doing um, to try and get his body healthier. So he was definitely working towards the right direction, but there's some issues going on. So he would be, yeah, he would be insulin resistant. And um, in that insulin resistance, um, I, you will see that those, several of those, uh, I'll just come up over here. Uh, several of those insulin are gonna be necessary to give uh, the effect of his, uh, of all those glucose getting outside the cell and back into the cell. So there's those receptors again, and now there's many more of them. In the patient that had the problem that I showed you his chart of, his cells have been bathed in insulin for a long time. They're resistant, and it takes a lot of those receptors to get the job done. In fact, in this situation, I have five, uh, five of those insulin hanging out as a reflection that it's taking a lot of insulin to get this job done. I also point out that his mitochondria are not like my mitochondria. His mitochondria have been damaged. Um, might have been damaged too, but I've been working hard to get them, to get these holes, see that right there? Those holes closed up. You can't repair the mitochondria, but you can change it over. You can say, hey, um, the mitochondrial uh, uh, autophagy is called mitophagy, and that really is the changing over of mitochondria. One of the ways you can do that is what I do every week, which is fast. Uh, there are other things you can do, like expose your body to heat, uh, do exercise, use this muscle cell. That would help the mitochondria turn over. All right, so his mitochondria are damaged. That is part and parcel uh, what happens with insulin being elevated for too many seasons, too many trips around the sun. So all of those insulin go along to the muscle cell and say, hey, that sugar on the outside is too high. We need you to put it in the cell. And when all five of those are bound, one straw, one of those receptors went to the, to the cellular uh, lining uh, right there and allowed the sugar through. And as soon as the blood sugar dropped, as soon as the sugar left the circulation, went into that muscle cell, it, uh, the, the one of those insulins dissociated. One of those insulins said, okay, the blood sugar's a little lower, I don't need to be here. But the only way that cell allowed the glucose in was if all five of them were in that parking spot. So that that is a, a visual representation of what it looks like to have insulin resistance. So now let's make our patient keto. Okay, so the first week he goes keto. And I, again, that, that chart that I showed you at the beginning was a, a 10, week to 10 days into lowering those carbohydrates, decreasing the blood sugar. As much as that blood sugar is still elevated, it is not as high as it was originally. Uh, so there is that uh, insulin that is higher uh, and blood sugar that's higher and those broken mitochondria inside the muscle cell. And look at what he did with 10 days of eating better. He has less insulin. You're like, oh my gosh, isn't that better? We lowered his insulin. His insulin is doing, he isn't producing as much of it. So why am I so worried about those high ketones? Mm, just wait, just wait, it's coming. So here comes those insulin and they are, there's only three of them. So they say, hey, you know, we're getting used to this. He's not eating as many carbohydrates. The blood sugar is less. That is a good thing, but his cells are insulin resistant. His cells are used to a really high signal to get those glucose from the blood from the blood into the cell. So with three of them binding to those receptor sites, guess what? <laughs> None of those glucose got across the cell membrane. Those glucose, in fact, you saw one of those uh, mitochondria die. It, it crumbled and went away because it starved to death. That cell said, hey, I need energy. And when that little, those little mitochondria were wiggling, it's, it's one way to represent, they're sending a signal, hey, we need fuel, we're gonna die. 
And that cell message to the uh, liver to make ketones is what pushed him into a wonderful state of ketosis. Except there's still not a lot of movement of that glucose inside the cell. It's still a really high blood sugar. Better than it was the week before, but not great. So let me show you what happens next. So that, that is a sign of high uh, insulin resistance. Um, and when it, time goes by, those three insulin are doing a better job. So let's say it's a week or so later. Now you've got glucose on the inside of that cell and you've got ketones on the inside of that cell. But um, the glucose still isn't great, <laughs> but it's better and the insulin is more sensitive. It is working on reducing this problem. Uh, but as a uh, sign of um, you know, more, resi more responsive insulin, uh, three of those insulins now come along, the blood sugars are no longer 180 or 240 like they were the week before. So now his blood sugar of 150 does say, oh, uh, here, yeah. So here's what used to happen is that when the blood sugar gets down to 100, yeah, the insulins weren't enough. When the blood sugar gets uh, up to 180, that uh, message says, oh, give me a few more receptors, fill them up. And now that glucose can cross that barrier again to, um, to fuel those mitochondria. So let me, let me just restate a few things here. This man was doing the right thing. He was lowering the amount of carbohydrates he needed. But take a look again at this chart. So um, let me just remind you that here is the uh, 180 blood sugar. This blood sugar at that height is definitely uh, the cause of what's aging his system. Um, if you've been checking blood sugars, if you look at these, uh, a couple things that I notice on this guy's chart are, th that was done at eight o'clock in the morning by, I think it was this number here, he's down to about 120, but that's at eight o'clock at night. So his ketones are responding, but his glucose is really dramatically changing. And that signal is gonna be a less amount of insulin and is going to stimulate the production of ketones. So here is ketones, you know, this is a ketone of three right there. Uh, this ketone of what, five point something there, 5.0, 5.1. Uh, it, it shows how robust his liver is at making ketones. But he is on the brink of not enough insulin coming out of his beta cells. And as I look at um, his story, I've seen it many times before. In fact, there's a really good, um, well, I would call him a friend, uh, who's had, who come, he does the best job at keto. And when he was struggling with the first few steps, uh, man, he, I, I hardly had a guy follow instructions better, keep carbs as low, and improve a system as fast as what he did because he was so diligent. The gentleman in this story, well, he's fallen off the wagon quite a few times. He is very social, he, is, he loves food, <laughs> maybe he loves food a little too much, and I mean, I think he praises God for food, and that's good, but he's had too much of it. As he tries to say goodbye to a season of life where he is eating too many carbohydrates, and in addition has, ha has a really high blood sugar, he's not as disciplined as what some of the other uh, patients have been. Uh, and his story I have seen hundreds of times before specifically uh, this other man who comes to the channel, does a great job, lowers his weight, lowers his blood pressure, lowers his hemoglobin A1C, makes ketones really well, checks data, is incredibly engaged at how do I never have this medical problem again? Um, and one of the other things that, that that really sick patient had was a high uric acid. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about uric acid over the next six months, so I'm gonna try not to dive into that right now, but it's a warning. When blood sugar is high, one of the waste products that happens is a high uric acid. And that high uric acid leads to things like gout, but it also leads to things like dementia. Uh, it also leads to things like cell death, like those beta cells that are found inside a pancreas, they are what produce insulin. And when you see somebody rescue, do really well, but has a lingering set of data, 
their blood sugars are a little higher than I would expect them to be. They make ketones and you wanna blame it on good genetics. Like, oh, they're making great ketones because their genetics say they're one of those you know, people that just make ketones really easily. Uh, but the other signal that something wasn't quite right was a trend upwards in his uric acid. <clears throat> I think he was keto for three years before a very strange thing started to happen. He makes these really robust ketones, right? Uh, and he's done that for a while, but they're higher than they used to be. And his blood sugar is continuing to rise despite a super narrow eating window. Not like the, the guy I introduced, not the preacher that is really a, a wonderful uh, example, but not when it comes to a ketogenic diet. He keeps falling off the wagon, he's cheating. Uh, the, the gentleman whose blood sugar is slowly rising, he's super disciplined. And what's happened inside his body is the beta cells that make insulin, they, their time ran out. And as he is transitioning into a type one diabetic, one that cannot make insulin, uh, the signal was they have high ketones and now their blood sugar is getting high as well. And, and that really is an important part of many of the biohackers out there that watch this channel and say, am I doing everything right? Um, please remember, I'm not medical advice. I'm just here to educate you. Your doctor has the medical advice but it's a really important thing to be aware of. They, they start to praise that they have great ketones and it's, uh, that's fine, but the ketones are higher than they should be. And the patient's like, I don't understand why I'm suddenly making so many ketones. Part of it is those mitochondria inside the cell are wiggling saying, please, please send me oxygen. Please send me a signal I, or please send me a glucose, not oxygen. <laughs> Give me any kind of fuel. And as that signal goes out, the liver will respond and make ketones, but um, the blood sugar goes up as well. And you know, I wish I could say that uh, there was only two patients that I've seen that have had this happen. Not true. There are many more patients that have had this happen. And I, I really do think that um, having an improved uh, metabolism should be this reward. Like if you try this in time, if you get this blood sugar to go down in time, there should never be a complication. Uh, isn't that the way life should be? But it's not. Uh, so the solution for this man is you have got to lower your insulin and your blood sugar. Uh, his beta cells are on the edge of uh, functioning. The, the gentleman whose beta cells died, his body did this exact same thing before he, you know, but he wasn't checking his blood sugar quite as, as well. Um, his body gave the signal of super high insulin resistance and ketones are low. I mean, ketones are high. So you've got high blood sugar, high ketones, but uh, it's this foreshadow that in the next six to eight months, things are going to stop working. Um, his hemoglobin A1C isn't that bad. I mean, it's seven. I don't want a hemoglobin A1C that high. His average blood sugar is north of 200. Um, but as you start to see those ketones rise and you have those blood sugars rise, uh, the message I told this man was, you have a timer. The timer on your beta cells, I've seen go wrong plenty of times. Stay the course, do not fall off the wagon, keep those carbs 20 total or less, do not, do not uh, slip up. And of course, the best thing we told him to do was he was now in a tribe. He was in a class uh, on that 21 day and they were going to be meeting even after we were done teaching them. They were going to be take the initiative on their own and have um, a support group because I can't you can't tell somebody never screw it up again. You know, I'm going to threaten you with your beta cells. I mean, even the people who come in and they've got cancer, they're, they're not perfect. They're human and they do mess it up. But what matters is how long did it take to get back on the, the wagon that had everything to do with a support group. Uh, so I, 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 I truly um, don't like seeing the stories that happened to this gentleman. Um, I, we sent a message out to him, the guy who the story is based on earlier today saying, uh, have you gone back to get your labs checked? And he hasn't yet, but we'll keep you posted. And everybody just say a prayer for that preacher to Stay the course, and if he fa fails, have grace for yourself like you do for the other people in your community, and get back on the wagon, because your those high ketones and the setting of high glucose means there's a timer. And 
even though he's been able to rescue from the edge every time so far, it's the saddest thing to watch to say you're going to have to inject insulin for the rest of your life because uh, you can't live without insulin. And once insulin resistance turns into a burned out beta cell, you're, you're my friend. You're going to end up with the prescriptions for the rest of your life. All right, so I have uh, some announcements that I want to make, and then I'm going to tell you the thing that that my son said, no, Mom, you cannot do that. And even this morning when I told my live support group, I well, I'll tell you what happened. Let's go, let's go do the announcements first. So I want to go to, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, a couple things that uh, several of you have written in about, and I want to make sure to tell you about this. So on our website, uh, thank you, thank you for those people who have uh, signed up for our um, our email list. I don't know if you can see that up there. Oh, I can't write on that. Sorry. <laughs> so their email list that says get keto secrets. I'm turning it red and blue there on that screen. Um, we, we love it. I've been putting uh, videos in there the last three weeks. We don't know if we're going to do it every week, but really trying to get you engaged in a place where there isn't censorship. Uh, so thank you for those of you that read those and encouraged us to keep doing that. We'll do our best to keep doing that. But I want you to see this part over here. See the part that says events. Many of you have written in saying, well, I, I know you've been on several other podcasts, but is it is there any place where it's kind of organized where you've been a guest on other podcasts? So we put together this calendar and the um, one of the recent ones was the Keto Camp podcast with Ben Azadi. Um, the uh, RV Carnivore did a podcast with us. And I've got uh, some really fun ones about the brain that are in here. If you, uh, if you load these images, you can see from the calendar the different podcasts that we've done in a more organized place. It also shows things like our Tuesday night, Tuesday, um, our Tuesday uh, support group uh, and other questions. But mostly it's if you want to hear some of the places where uh, we've done a, an, either an audio podcast or a video podcast. You can come here and find those lectures. Uh, so th again, I, I want to say thanks to my team for getting that set up and getting it organized. Um, and let me now go over to our final wide lens. Okay, so I'm not putting the chat here, but I am watching it because I I really do. We're, I'm going to take your questions here in a minute, but I do really want to have this announcement in a way that not everybody jumps on the negative bandwagon. Um, I'm going to be doing something that when I first told uh, my my support group at the Pin Chasers this morning, well, I knew it was going to have some, feet, some negative pushback. And so I did it live with them this morning. And my team and I have really, um, well, there's no other way this story could have played out than to have me do this in a transparent way. That I have for many years talked about how important the insides of your cells are, but I'm gonna do something that is, well, there's no medical reason to do this. <laughs> uh, I'm going to spend next week explaining some of the science that really took me down this rabbit hole and has landed me at a place that, well, might seem vain to many of you. Um, I talk about how important it is that your metabolic health is stable, that your metabolic health is uh, a result of the chemistry set that you make inside your body, and, um, and how the outside looks is a reflection of that. Uh, many of you have seen on this show how I've reversed age. And that can sound like a, like a silly uh, you know, bumper sticker or a, you know, a meme, but it really is a reversal of age. And I have a birthday coming up at the end of the month, uh, end of November. I'll be 52. And uh, I am still not, I am not even pre-menopause. I mean, I haven't gone through menopause. And so I know that I have one year left where I have the ability to do something pretty powerful that I'll never get to do again. And again, it is not for anything except vain reasons. And when I told the team, when I told uh, the support group this morning about this, I, uh, I, I got, some of them were definitely unsettled. Like, oh, I, I watch you every week. I know that you have these great outcomes because you fast every week for the last five years. Uh, that you test your numbers, that you are accountable to us on that show. 
Uh, so why would you do that? I, it's very similar to what my son said. Mom, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> so uh, I'll tell you what I'm doing. It is a, uh, it is a CO2 laser resurfacing. I'm going to go into next week why I'm doing it, but I wanted to post that today and tell you this uh, because I'm not going to hide it. That I know that, that what I'm doing is, well, it's, it's vanity. <laughs> I like the way my skin looks. I know that I'm about to go through a rapid aging process no matter what. Estrogen is going to decrease and some things are going to happen inside my skin. And for the last three years, I've been working on this great little formula of a, the skin oil that I use. And I don't know if it's ever going to get to the market at this rate because we've run into so many more problems than we have with our other products that it might be a one and done sell. If I get it to the market, sell it and maybe never do it again. But what that whole three year process has done is a bunch of, well, distractions might be right, of how does skin age? And why is why did I stop doing a couple of things that I thought would be great? I thought they would be awesome, but the more I studied them, I'm like, I won't put my name behind that. That's not gonna help the people that are watching me. And in many ways, uh, what I'm about to do to my face, well, I'm gonna tell you about it next week. It, uh, the science of what, why I'm doing it doesn't excuse that there is no medical reason. I mean, I don't like the brown spots. Yes, I had too many sunburns. And the pictures are horrifying, but I'm not gonna hide it. I'm going to show you what it's like. I am very curious. I am, I'm just not gonna hide that I'm gonna have a treatment done to my face. And I'll do it the day after the show. So next uh, Tuesday night, I will go through some of the science. Um, and I know that several of you are uh, have already expressed, and this morning was no exception, that uh, some said, go ahead, do it. I mean, it, it, I, I'm fascinated, I want to watch. And they really want to know what I've learned over the last few years. But several of them were like, God made you just the way you are. You are beautiful, <laughs> which is exactly what my son said too. Mom, why would you do that? And I'm like, hey, <laughs> don't judge me. I, I know I've been taking care of women. I know exactly what happens over the 10 years. And I am sure I will be one of those old ladies with gray hair and wrinkles and not care. But I'd like to put that off for about 10 more years. And I couldn't do it if my metabolism wasn't this strong. And I know I don't get the results if I wait till I go through menopause. So. I'm excited to show you the science next week, and then if you really want to watch to see how this experiment goes, I did tell my team, there's nothing better for brand than to say, how quickly can I heal from a scheduled programmed burn? <laughs> Essentially, it's a burn of your face, and your cytokines respond, and your immune system takes over, and your body stimulates the growth of new cells. Uh, which is what reverses the wrinkles. But we're going to talk about that next week. <laughs> so um, uh, many people are saying, I'm, I'm reading the comments now, I don't understand. Why would you do that? What are you, what are you doing this for? Um, but I would encourage you to tune in next week <laughs> and see what I'm talking about. And then, oh heck, judge me. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what it does. I am not going to hide it. I'm not going on vacation just to get a, a procedure on my face done. So you'll see my red skin, and I'll probably post it on YouTube or not YouTube, um, uh, Twitter or Instagram. All right, <laughs> that's a that's a fact. Yes. Yeah. So let let me. Uh, uh, first of all, I appreciate the hearts of the people saying just go ahead and do it. Uh, and it's probably not as big of a deal to you as it is to me. But I did not want to hide it, and I did not want it to be a secret. Um, I, I think many women have this vanity point in their life, and I've coached many of them saying, you shouldn't do that procedure. You don't need to do that. And now that it's my turn, I'm like, huh, I kind of want to do it. <laughs> I kind of want to do it. Uh, and I'm not going under anesthesia, but I'll tell you more about this procedure next week as I... I have a beautiful skin slide that I've been waiting to show you. All right, let's get to some of your questions and off of my little um, <laughs> my little dance of what am I going to do with my face? Uh, oh, Lisa, I'm so happy to read your <laughs> read your um, question because it is um, it's not about my face. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so let me get to uh, I got to make it a little bit smaller here so it fits. Um, 
there we go. She writes in, will the liver get better at making ketones the longer you are consistently keto and living a keto lifestyle? Yeah, that was actually part of that point. Thank you for bringing me back to that. This gentleman was overproducing ketones because his cells were starving. Uh, those mitochondria were starving inside. Once his those ketones go inside and the mitochondria are replaced with healthy ones. Those broken mitochondria, yes, they can use a ketone, but there's lots of inefficiencies about how they produce fuel. So one, if he can push through and stay the course for that two weeks, uh, doesn't have to be two weeks, but I know at the end of two weeks, it's amazing. Many people, it's a lot better in like 72 hours, maybe that three to four days. But if you push to two weeks, those you have a lot of mitophagy that's happened, a lot of mitochondria that are brand new and doing a great job at supporting uh, the demand for fuel. Uh, so yes, the liver will get better. It will stop overproducing. But more importantly, as that insulin lowers and stays low, uh, now the signal to get glucose in and the, if the ability to use ketones are the two-pronged way that your body can deliver fuel inside that cell. All right, uh, I am 52 hours into a 72 hour fast. My ketones are still non-existent. Fell off the wagon with sugar. Will pucker up break my fast? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so yes, you're seeing me uh, drink pucker up and it is something that I don't, it doesn't, okay, here's why pucker up doesn't break your fast. Uh, First of all, the only thing in here is liquid ketones. There's no sugar substitute. The reason it tastes so stinking sour is because there's no flavoring, there's no fillers, there's no extra, there's no salt, there's nothing in here but ketones. And ketones have two options in your blood once, once they get absorbed in your blood. One, you can burn them as energy so you feel better. Or two, you pee them out. You cannot store it. When people put in, um, glucose or sugar uh, or even fat yes it can get stored uh, mct can get stored sugar can get stored um the ketones cannot be stored once a, a fat breaks down into a ketone again same two options you're either going to pee it out or you're i mean or breathe it out somehow you're going to get rid of it um or burn it at, in your mitochondria as energy so when somebody is struggling, first of all, I want to tell you congratulations on the 52 hours, and I highly recommend you push to 72. In people whose ketones are yet to be produced, there's the reason we are pushing them to a 72 hour fast is because that is often what it takes to, to lower the insulin enough to send that little signal and say, make ketones. And as much as pucker up will raise your ketones, it is nothing like the tsunami of ketones that come out of a liver when those mitochondria are wiggling like that, saying, hey, hey, I'm gonna die if you don't get me some energy. That is a life-saving life mechanism for survival, is to make those ketones, but you have to lower the insulin. And when folks have been off the wagon for a while, they really do not, um, I mean, even if they've been insulin resistant, they were doing great, and then they go back on a sugar binge, I mean, a 72 hour fast is, is a wonderful way to do it. A, a sardine fast is another really great way to do that. Um, one, you know, one food for three days. We, uh, in the email this, this week, we are announcing a, a sardine challenge. Again, we're trying to do it off the platforms that are censored. So we'll, we'll have a Slack line, a Slack community, I guess it's called. Maybe it's not a Slack line. Slack community where you can talk about this. We're going to do the sardine fast uh, next week. So if you want to join us, if, if you're having this much trouble and you're reaching for a 72 hour fast, congratulations. That's a big deal. But if you're 52 hours in and you don't have any ketones, you're pretty insulin resistant. So you might want to do a sardine challenge next week with us. But great question. All right, let's go to the other questions. Um, all right. Dr. Boz, well, uh, no, that's not, what? What test shows your mitochondria sat status to see if they're damaged? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Because you can't actually see it. You, well, researchers can see it. They look at what, um, okay, so those holes, let's see if I can pull that slide up. Those holes inside that mitochondria, uh, they are um, where electrons leak out of. Let's see, where is that slide? Um, 
I'll see if I can pull it up. Uh, the point is that when those mitochondria have those those spaces in them, as energy flows along that electron tra uh, chain transport, uh, you are losing uh, negatively charged uh, energy, uh, mole uh, electrons is what they are. And those electrons buzz around and they cause damage. Um, one of the ways that I look at mitochondrial health, um, okay, so this is really geeky, but it's how quickly you get into zone two and how well you offload heat. Um, zone two exercise is a, a level of production of energy from your mitochondria that um, people that are very unhealthy, they kind of skip right over zone two and go into zone three or four. Uh, so how well you can match the demands of your body is a really good measurement of your mitochondrial health. VO2 max is a, if you Google that, it's a really, I've never, done, I've never tested my VO2 max. It's really a lot of work and it's a lot of energy, but it's looking at when the body puts demands on your system, how quickly can you match it and how stable can you be as you match it? Uh, to me, that's one of the like hallmarks of how healthy are your mitochondria. But because we can't really do that, I look at how high is their insulin? What's their morning fasting glucose? What's the glucose, how high does the glucose go after they eat? Um, how long does it take for the glucose to get back down to the bottom after they've eaten? So all of those things do a pretty, uh, it's a collection of this is a stress on the mitochondria, this is a stress on the mitochondria, this is a, you know, uric acid is another major marker of how healthy are your mitochondria. So there's not one test. I mean, I suppose VO2 max could be considered one test, but that's a nightmare. I would never do that. I've never done that. Um, and, but the collection of lab tests that we go through, like hemoglo you know, what's your average blood sugar? What's your uh, C-reactive protein? What's your morning fasting glucose? What's your morning fasting ketones? Um, how well can you control the glucose when you eat? All of those are gonna be ways you tell about your mitochondria. That's a great question. Mm, I haven't ever had that one. All right, let's go back and get a couple more. Thanks for writing these in, by the way. Um, why can't someone test insulin function? <laughs> Wouldn't a periodic glucose tolerance test with insulin set be appropriate if you still are making insulin? Okay, that is a brilliant idea. <laughs> and I've been to that chapter and I've spent a lot of people's money trying to do this. So it's called a craft insulin test and Kraft, with a K, was the man who studied this in people. He looked at insulin levels and then gave them the glucose, insulin and glucose levels, gave them the glucose and watched how high their insulin and glucose did, went over the course of, I think his was 180 minutes. So two hours, maybe three, yeah, 120, yeah, a couple of hours. And he did hundreds of people. And he saw, hey, the problem isn't the glucose, guys. The glucose doesn't raise first, the insulin does. And so you'd think an insulin craft test is not that much harder. You give them, you put them in the protocol for a glucose tolerance test and you just check insulin along the way. I'm gonna let you put in the comments, guess how much the test cost? I mean, a glucose tolerance test is somewhere around 100 bucks, maybe 150 bucks, because it's glucose and blood sugar testing. When you added insulin to this, and first of all, they screwed it up like three times. They screwed up doing the insulin and testing the insulin and so it was like the third or fourth time this patient went through it. And by the time he got two hours of glucose and insulin after taking that sugar, take a guess how much it cost him. I gotta make sure I'm watching the comments here um, because it shocked me. It shocked me in a big way. Um, so yes, you could do that. It's because of this story though that I have been a promise. Somebody says 1200, so close. It's actually double that, so go a little higher. Um, let's see if anybody else is brave enough to put in a number. Um, yeah, 1,500 is what somebody said. I'm gonna go, the live chat will show you this. 1,500, 2,500, thank you from Chile. It was $2,500 that they paid, they, they were billed for checking glucose and ketones, or glucose and insulin after swallowing sugar. It was awful. I'm like, you, you could have bought a few beta cells for that. I mean, that's a terrible expensive test. And the sad part is now you know his insulin function at one point in time. So if you wanna check it like three or four times, like after you do an intervention, you, nobody's gonna pay that much money to do that. And this is really where the Dr. Boz ratio came into 
effect. When you look at, so if you can't measure insulin, I mean, insulin just does this. It's so volatile that I could hook you up to a, you know, check your insulin every three or four minutes and it changes. It goes up and down and up and down. It's just really volatile. But what does insulin control? Glucose and ketones. And so by watching the two of those, especially in ratio, the lower the, glu the, lower the Dr. Boz ratio, the better your insulin is functioning. The higher your Dr. Boz ratio, well, either you just ate a bunch of sugar and all your ketones went to pot, but the, the ability for you to control that Dr. Boz ratio, like they fast and it responds. Um, they keep their carb uh, count down and it responds. So not just can you get that Dr. Boz ratio under 80 and you know under 40 is amazing and under 20 is just really a good stress, a good metabolic workout for your mitochondria, but did you have to do like that other gal? Did you have to fast for 72 hours to get it to drop there? And in that case, it's showing me your insulin is not very sensitive. It really is taking you a long time to to rally the metabolic response from your body. And um, uh, yeah, I think that is, I mean, it's, that, that's a much better way to do it is to have a insulin response. Okay, I'm gonna check my numbers one more time, but I'm, I'm gonna do one more question here before I do that. Okay, so Julie writes in, hi, Dr. Boz. So how do I clean up my fatty liver pancreas so these mitochondria don't die? Yes, Julie, that's a great question. <laughs> Uh, number one is the stuff that we've been preaching on here. Uh, you know, I, I did a, a quick uh, discussion about cl cholesterol in the last week, and I kept saying, but you need to watch that one video I made which says, this m number matters most. You, ha you have to fix this number before we worry about your cholesterol. And that is your average blood sugar. Um, when people say, how do I clean this out? You've got to get the blood sugar down, which means you got to get the, which will bring your insulin down. And it's that response of insulin and response of, uh, I mean, the insulin is in response to lowering the blood sugar. So once you lower the blood sugar and you say, well, wait, all that blood sugar is there. Yeah, but your body will use it up. Uh, it'll get lower over time as long as you stop eating this. And then you're going to be emptying glucose from the, that liver that's been in storage. And so it takes time, but that is why I'm such a big advocate for a support group, because you won't get it done in a sprint. Um, and I've given several examples, I call it um, the patient who goes ass over apricot <laughs> into keto. They come in, they're, they're the best they're gonna be, they, wait, they do all this stuff, they jump right to 72 hour fasting, and they tumble all the way down the hill with a whole bunch of problems. I mean, that's what the whole book of consistently uh, the keto continuum was written about like that's what happened he just went i'm gonna do everything you tell me and i'm gonna do it so high and so fast and so quick and then he crashed and burned and i'm like no nah, wait you're into this support group he was in my support group in sioux falls and i'm like just keep coming just don't give up and he got a little better and a little better and a little better and the weight came off and it came off and it came off and that guy was very similar to what this chart was his blood sugars were high and his ketones were higher than they should have been. He was insulin resistant. His cells were starving on the inside. And it's that steady, consistent, decrease the carbs, get down to, you know, follow the keto continuum, get to two boluses of food per day, get those two boluses of food within eight hours, uh, give up the morning, you know, so each of these is a step. And when people come in and say, I'm just gonna skip to the last chapter and do it like that, well, your cells aren't in shape for that. You're gonna crash and burn. You're gonna hate me because your brain's gonna go a little wiggly. And in the end, you'll probably fall off. Um, all right, so I will, f uh, uh, actually the last question says, can we take vitamins and supplements while fasting? Um, that is another good question. While I'm checking my blood sugar, I'll answer that one. Uh, vitamins and supplements. Um, the vitamins I don't have people take, I think you're, if you're stimulating autophagy, um, well, you're getting a bunch of, um, you're mobilizing a bunch of vitamins out of fat. That, that Fat-based vitamins that are stuck in fat cells is a real thing. And I had a few people do this experiment where they check their vitamin D every, um, um, they have a low vitamin D. They're very overweight and insulin resistant. And then we have them check their vitamin D um, as they stay really consistently keto. Like ketones are staying between 1.5 and 2.5 for the first month. 
and that um, awareness of the uh, they, they don't have any idea that their their vitamin D was going up and up and up. So you are mobilizing fat-based hormones when you are uh, in a ketogenic state. Um, fasting lowers the insulin the most and really does raise that. So let's see how I'm doing. Um, blood sugar is about the same. Ketones are up to 5.8. Yeah, so again, I drank the ketones uh, in here and it's only about this. Yeah, really only about that. And I'm, I'm preparing for this surgery next, or not surgery, this fry my face thing next week. So I want a very anti-inflammatory state. So I'm doing a lot of things right. <laughs> Again, the stakes are high. Uh, how healthy am I? Well, I don't know, how fast will I heal from this? I'll tell you, the dermatologist is fascinated. Like, I can't wait to see this. <laughs> So tune in, I appreciate the praise for those of you that supported me. And I, again, um, I really do thank you for being somebody who shows up on Tuesdays, uh, uh, supports our, our efforts at educating you and um, pray for me. <laughs> we will see you next.